Okay, well, I, I think we'll go ahead and get started here. We have a good group of people joining us. Thank you so much for joining us here. Um, this is the on-site stormwater management BMPs uh, presentation. Uh, this is the City of Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections, um, the Seattle Home Fair. Uh, my name is Eric Drips. I'm with SDCI Drainage Review, and we also have Jessica Banner uh, Batterman. Sorry about that, Jessica. Uh, also, drainage reviewer here uh, with uh, with us today. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for joining us. We we have a couple of these presentations um, scheduled remotely. So there was two last week. Uh, to today, and I believe to next week as well. Um, and that is a follow up to the in person Seattle home fair, which will be held at the uh, we'll have additional details again later. Uh, it's going to be at the um, Filipino community center in Seattle. And that'll be on the Saturday, the 25th. So that'll give you an opportunity if you would like to. Um, come in, we'll have lots of different booths set up for the different um, reviewers at at SDCI. So you can come in and talk about your project and um, get some questions answered. And that will be in person later this month if uh, you would like to attend. So let's see, let's go to the next slide. Um, just want to let everybody know that we will be recording this presentation and oh, I, somebody beat me to the punch in the chat. So, yes, we are recording this session as well as the other sessions as well. Uh, we'll provide a link at the end of the presentation of where those recordings will be. So those will be available for you to review if uh, you miss something. Um, and also, if there's other, if you're interested in our other presentations, those will be, a, those are also available for recording um, as well. Let's see. Uh, also, we'll be sending out a survey at the end of the presentation as well. Uh, if you could, if you could. Uh, if you're able to fill that out at the end, we'll provide a link. It'll help oh, us. Yeah, mm -hmm. that'll work. Um, muted here. Um, so it, during the presentation, uh, you feel free to s enter questions into the chat. We'll monitor them, and it'll help break up some of the. Uh, so I'm not having to just talk the whole time so we can we can field some questions as we go. Uh, feel free to enter that into the chat. Uh, Jessica will be helping field some of those questions and also maybe bring them up um, as well. And feel free to raise your hand as well in the participant list if you uh, if you feel like your question will be better asked uh, um, in audio. So. Let's see. So I think that's all for the housekeeping. So let's uh, go ahead and get started. So overall, the presentation, we're going to going to provide some background on stormwater and side sewers in the city of Seattle to provide some context to the conversation. Uh, and then I'll get into some specifics about drainage review and permitting. So us on the drainage review team, we review for conformance with the stormwater code and the side sewer code. And uh, we require certain documentation to be provided with building permit submittals. And I'll go over some of those requirements for you uh, if you are in fact in the, maybe in the process or thinking about submitting. Uh, an application for a building permit and need to know about how to submit some of the materials will require. Uh, and then also get into a little bit of the specifics about on site stormwater management BMPs themselves. Uh, go through the different BMPs that are available and uh, just get into a little deep, a little bit of the details about on site stormwater management BMPs, which 
best management practices is what that acronym is short for. And uh, again, feel free to answer or ask questions throughout. Uh, we'll, we'll have some additional time at the end to get into some more detailed questions. So um, yeah, with that, uh, I'll get started here. We'll keep going. Um, so the stormwater code page, I just want to share the stormwater code page um, kind of as a good reference point for all of our requirements. If you do an online, the easiest way to, to get there is probably just do an online search for stormwater code Seattle. That, that should get you there. Um, this is really our clearinghouse for uh, all the different documentation that you would need for both understanding this, the actual code itself, uh, as well as preparing the materials that we require for uh, permit review and approval. So have the, the manual, which is goes into a lot more detail uh, about the specifics about how we administer the code. So there's um, uh, all of the different appendices and volumes there. Uh, the forms and documents section, these are, this is where you're going to find some of the materials that you'll, you may or may not need for submitting your building permit, uh, application to meet the stormwater code, um, and some additional documents here as well. So this is a good place to go, um, just in general to find all the information about, uh, stormwater code in Seattle and how it relates to building permitting. So I just want to start off with a little background to provide some context to uh, the uh, stormwater in, in Seattle. So the code itself is meant to protect life, property, and the environment. Uh, the city of Seattle has an NPDES permit, which is a national permit that uh, as a result of the Clean Water Act, uh, the city is required to have this permit so that we can manage stormwater in the city in a way that protects the waters of the state. So that would be thing. The waters of the state would be Lake Union, Puget Sound, Lake Washington. All the stormwater eventually ends up there, and the city is responsible for making sure that uh, we do the best that we can to make sure that that water is not polluted as it goes into those uh, bodies of water. Um, so the, the city is accountable to the state and, uh, through that permit and that part of the reason why we, uh, review for the stormwater code is to make sure that we're in compliance with that permit. Um, the city of Seattle was broken up into different types of systems for how we manage stormwater before it gets to those bodies of water. So there's a separated system. That's where the sanitary flow, which is coming from the buildings and the stormwater flow, which is coming from rainwater, um, are completely separate. So those are separate systems. Um, there's also combined systems where the stormwater and the sanitary go to the same pipe. Um, and any sanitary or combined system gets treated at, uh, the, the treatment plant. Um, and small treatment plants throughout the city. And um, then there's partially separated systems as well. Uh, the, the city originally was mo uh, mostly combined and uh, starting in like the 60s and 70s, they actually started to build more storm main pipes to get the system separated. Uh, part of the, the, the reason for that is the treatment system and just the conveyance system as a whole really can't handle all the sanitary flow and all the stormwater flow. So what happens is when you have a big rainfall event, the the pipes overflow into the the bodies of into uh, say Lake Union or something like that. Uh, and reducing that was a goal of separating the system out. And uh, so that you can get that stormwater that goes directly to uh, the waters of the state and 
uh, without the overflows and the sanitary flow is going to the treatment plant. So you can see this map here that kind of breaks down the areas of the city that are combined, uh, partially separated and fully separated. You can see a big chunk up here uh, in North Seattle that is fully separated. Uh, so that's just over and the requirements for the property uh, that has the project is, is going to depend a lot about what system it's connected to. So, um, you know, say, for example, if it's in a separated system and you're going to the storm main, uh, we may need more treatment because that storm water is going directly to the waters of the state. So that water needs to be treated, whereas in the combined system, we are more worried about capacity. So um, that's where the, the flow control comes into uh, effect. So really, you're trying to reduce uh, flows that are going to that system so that during a storm event, the uh, combined sewer overflows don't happen as, as often. So side sewers are the actual pipe that connects from the private property to the public system, whether it's the combined system or storm system. Side sewers include uh, both storm and sanitary pipes. And uh, the side sewers are owned from, from the building all the way to the main. So you can see this diagram here, uh, the, the main line is typically in the middle of the street or at least in a portion of the street. Uh, sometimes it's not in the right of way, but uh, just because the side sewer is going into public property, that pipe itself is still owned by the private property it serves um, until it gets to the first connection to the main itself. So, um, Side sewer permits are the way that we administer any sort of work that's being done on a side sewer. So that could be a repair permit. It could be uh, a connection to the main for new construction. Anytime you're actually doing any physical work on the pipe, it requires a side sewer permit to be issued. And uh, we administer those here at SDCI. Um, Permits are not required for things like if you just need to clean out your side sewer um, or scope it, which just means you're taking a look at maybe the condition of the pipe. Um, here, there's a couple links here in the presentation that are that may be helpful for you. So this this first website is our side sewer permit website. So that's going to take you through the process for how you actually apply for a side sewer permit. Um, we also have a couple other links to websites that just have some helpful information about side sewers themselves. Um, this website from uh, Seattle Public Utilities, uh, it's really tailored for homeowners or property owners that want to learn more about their side sewer and maybe some potential issues that might come up. Um, there's things about maintenance for side sewers. So these are some helpful websites for um, for learning more about your side sewer. And there's also a link to the mapping. Um, this isn't the actual mapping, but uh, that the link is for, but there's a link so that you can actually look at the map, find your property, and actually look at where the location of your side sewer is. So you can see for this property, the uh, magenta line is serving this property that goes out to this um, combined sewer main in the street. So there is mapping public available for you that you can get information about a specific property. So, when we talk about approved points of discharge, just going back to what I had been discussing about how there's different systems within the city of Seattle, uh, the approved point of discharge is where by code, the city is uh, uh, permitting a connection to the public system. 
So it can vary a lot by uh, where the property is located. Sometimes you might have a property right on, say, uh, Lake Washington, and the, the stormwater goes right into uh, Lake Washington. You could have a connection public storm main, ditch and culvert system. Those are really common in North Seattle. Um, and uh, it could be a curb weep connection, which is just the pipe coming out the curb. So then the water travels down to a public inlet in the street, alley discharge, combined sewer. Um, the on site infiltration dispersion, I'll get into a little bit more detail about that. When there's not actually any public infrastructure within the property frontage that can serve that property, if you're going to be redeveloping the site, it needs the the storm not water needs to be managed on site. It needs to discharge on site, and there's a lot of specific requirements that apply to that, um, because we have to make sure that the site is able to handle that storm water. Most commonly, it's going to be through infiltration, through a um, say a dry well or a rock pit where the, the water slowly gets into the ground. Um, but I'll go into a little bit more detail later about that, but um, some properties specifically have that as the approved point of discharge and it, it has uh, special requirements for that. Um, and then sanitary points of discharge, we also look at that as well. Um, it's either gonna go to a combined system or a sanitary only system and um, you know, there, there's still going to be rules guiding when and where you can connect to the public system. Um, but at least from a standpoint of what type of system it goes to, uh, the sanitary system is, is pretty straightforward. There's, there's not, there's really a limited amount of properties within the city of Seattle that go to septic systems. Um, most go to the public system. Um, just seeing, okay. So just going to talk a little bit about review thresholds. So these are thresholds for when we would actually even look at a project for conformance with the stormwater code and the thresholds for drainage review are going to be based on your new and replaced hard surface. Uh, hard surfaces include any impervious surface um, or permeable pavement or vegetated roof. So any surface by which most of the water runs off, um, that's really what we're, we're concerned with. Landscaping areas, they essentially manage stormwater on their own. But once you have an impervious surface, then that water has to go somewhere. And when the threshold is is based upon that new and replaced hard surface. So we need to figure out where that water is going to go, how it's going to be managed. And the, you know, the aspect of replaced, um, there's, there's a distinction. So you could say resurface your driveway, that wouldn't be replacing it. But if you dug it up to the base course and then rebuilt that driveway, then that's going to be considered replaced. Um, and that goes towards the threshold and also any building that's removed down to the foundation. So you're removing the whole house down to the foundation, exposing dirt and then building back up. Um, that's gonna be considered replaced as well. Um, but if you're just replacing a roof or maybe doing improvements uh, you know, to the basement or something like that, that's uh, not gonna be considered replaced. And, we wouldn't consider that area towards the um, towards the threshold. Uh, here's just kind of a quick diagram about the different requirements uh, and based upon the new plus replaced hard surface. So drainage reviews required when there is 750 square feet or more of new plus replaced hard surface. This is actually not quite accurate because it's um, greater than or equal to. So once you hit that 750, then drainage reviews required uh, for that project. 
And then as you go up in hard surfaces, other requirements might apply. Another key one that we're going to be talking about a little bit later on is on site stormwater management. And on site stormwater management is required when the project has 1500 square feet or more of new plus replaced hard surface. So, when drainage review is required, so we're going to assume that your project, your theoretical project is over 750 or greater than or equal to 750 square feet of new plus replaced hard surface, then drainage review is required. And um, here's, you know, what will require when drainage re review is required. There's going to be 2 standard plans that we'll, we'll take a look at later in this presentation. Uh, the construction stormwater control plan, which is basically how are you going to manage your stormwater during construction? And then the drainage and wastewater control plan, which is how are you managing your uh, stormwater and wastewater in the permanent condition? Uh, a lot of the requirements are going to be based um, on the approved point of discharge. Typically, this will be given to you from the department through the preliminary assessment report process, if anybody's familiar with that after you've submitted a uh, pre-application site visit um, request, then uh, for larger projects, you're, you're going to get an actual report and it goes through all uh, a lot of different departments, not just SDCI with the city that's going to give you a good outline of everything that's going to be required for your project. Uh, in that report, you're going to get, you're going to have a drainage section and it's going to detail your approved point of discharge. It's going to summarize a lot of the different requirements for your project. So for most projects, that's go be going to be how you determine your approved point of discharge. For smaller projects, you, you may not get a full report. You'll just get the pre-application site visit. So for those, you know, we want to, for most of those, drainage review is not going to be required. But uh, sometimes drainage review is required for some of those small projects that you don't get the full report. So we, we do encourage you to contact us as you're preparing your application. Uh, uh, materials so that you can understand a little bit more about the specific requirements for your project. And uh, I think Jessica put some of that information in the chat. Uh, uh, here, here's our general group email is site sewer info at seattle.gov. Uh, we, we staff that every day um, by different drainage reviewers and we, we usually get back to you that day. Um, so uh, feel free to email us at that. That's a, more of a general email. Um, if you do get a PAR, you could email the specific drainage reviewer that's listed on the PAR itself. Um, or if you're in review, you can contact the actual drainage reviewer that is assigned to, uh, to that project for specific questions. Uh, you can also check out our virtual app, applicant services center. Um, we used to have the in-person center here at the municipal tower. Um, we, we now have a virtual applicant services center. Uh, we staff that for live chats um, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 9 till 3 and Tuesday, Thursday from 1030 to 3. So if you go to our homepage, you can see there's a little chat function at the bottom right hand corner. and that's not just for drainage review, although we do uh, staff that you can hop on there and ask any any sort of uh, building question uh, from our department. So let's uh, talk about on site stormwater management. So basically the on site stormwater management is a way to um, exactly what it what it is uh, manage stormwater on site it's it's meant to try and treat stormwater reduce the amount of stormwater flows that that go off site um, 
it's it's different best management practices to 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 um, help accomplish those stormwater functions on site rather than um, you know larger facilities off site. Uh, the on site stormwater management requirement um, again it's for projects that have 1500 square feet or more of new plus replaced hard surface uh, to meet the on site stormwater management requirement. You, you have to evaluate the list of all of the BMPs, and we're going to go into more detail about the specific BMPs that are available. Um, you Basically, you want to run through this list and determine the most highly functional one that is feasible. So you're, you're trying to pick the best one that is feasible for the site. Um, and we'll go through the list and, and show what the more effective ones are and there's also a way to meet it that uh, would require an engineer this is uh, a lot less common um, the the list approach was developed really to uh, so to help applicants meet this requirement without having you know a, a professional do the do the work um, so we have a, a calculator which I'll show and um, try to make the process as straightforward as possible so that you're able to demonstrate that you're meeting that requirement without um, actually hiring a professional for it. Um, the performance st standard would be a way of demonstrating that with stormwater modeling. So this is the full list of the BMPs that are available. The highest category, these are going to be considered the most effective for um, the amount of stormwater that they're able to manage before they would discharge off site. And the, the lower categories are going to be the less effective. So you have to run through the list basically showing that you are, uh, you select the highest one possible. So you have to go through category one before you go to category two. Once you get to one of those categories, you can select anyone within the category. Um, you basically go just down the list and look at your site and see which uh, BMP would be feasible for a given hard surface on the site. So the calculator, and I have an example here. So this is the on-site stormwater management calculator. This is going to be basically a summary of all the stormwater requirements for the site and um, it needs to be shown on the drainage and wastewater control plan so you fill one of these out for every single project that requires drainage review let me zoom in a little bit here um, it's most of this information and you can see reference the preliminary assessment report is going to be listed on that report particularly your approved points of discharge um, so you have that preliminary assessment report and enter that information onto the on-site stormwater management calculator. And um, then at the bottom here, this is where you're going to actually list your hard surfaces and how you're mitigating them. Um, if we look at the instructions tab, you can see basically break your project up into the various hard surfaces that are proposed. So these are just the new and replaced hard surfaces and how you're going to mitigate them. So you have the different surfaces by number and then you show the BMP that you've selected and uh, additional information is required on actual plan. I'll show a couple examples later in the in the um, presentation, but this is an overall way of looking at the project, the different hard surfaces and how they need to be shown on the plans. And this project summary is going to show the BMP, uh, the contributing area, and this is the how big the BMP is, needs to be in using the pre-sized method. Um, when you enter your number of surfaces, then you go over to that particular surface and fill out all of the detail. So, as I had said, is you, you need to show that the highest category is not feasible before you move on to the next one. And in the workbook, you're gonna actually document the reason why it's not feasible. 
So um, it, that can vary by each one of the BMPs, but there's a list of acceptable infeasibility criteria. You select the one that it applies for your site. Um, it has to be justified. And um, sometimes a reviewer might need more information to show how that infeasibility criteria applies to your site. Um, most of them should be fairly straightforward. Um, I'm going to get into a little bit more detail about in infiltration investigation. That's category one and two. Uh, if, 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 if infiltration investigation is not required, that's going to be your infeasibility criteria. So you go all the way down the list before you actually select one. And when you select one, then you say use BMP. And then you get it size. So you go over to the sizing calculator. And uh, the sizing is built into the calculator based on the amount of area going to it. So once you put in your uh, amount of contributing area, it's going to automatically give you a size. And then you put that size on the plan. And again, this, this uh, pro project summary sheet is the, uh, you're going to actually have this located on your drainage and wastewater control plan after you complete it. Uh, also, you're going to need to submit a PDF of the entire workbook so that your drainage reviewer can look at the different infeasibility criteria that you selected and verify that it's all um, justifiable. Um, looks like I'm getting some questions, but they're in my private chat here. Sorry about that, Eric. I did put a comment to send them to all. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so let me try to. Thank you. I, I just can't see those ones when they go to you directly. Let me try it. I'm going to copy and put it in the public chat. Okay, so uh, building a Dale Dadu and failed the infiltration test, do I have to hire an engineer to design an alternative plan? Um, so that depends. Uh, if you have a project that is just, if you're just doing on site stormwater management, if you're infiltrate, and I'll get into some more detail about infiltration testing, um, that might help answer that question, but um i it 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 depends but more than likely you would not need to hire an engineer um if your infiltration test fails you're just not going to use those bmps that have infiltration um but i'll get into more detail about that that might um provide some more perspective on that um new dadu on type of an existing garage 150 new hard surface uh, does not have downspouts, total existing garage. Does this mean no drainage? Yeah, I mean, no drainage review is required if you're under 750 square feet. Um, basically, uh, for this situation, uh, you know, since drainage review is not required, basically those downspouts can continue to drain as they do currently. Um, you know, if there's no uh, downspouts, it's it's shedding somewhere, so technically it it could continue to do that. Um, but I mean, short answer, no. Drainage review is not required because you're only adding a certain amount of new and replaced hard surface. Um, answering where the drainage goes that might be a little bit more complicated and specific to the site. Um, but yeah, short answer drainage review would not be required based on your description. Um, we have hard surfaces as a part of an easement. Do we include the total hard surface of the area or just the area on the property? Um, yeah, if you're replacing hard surfaces on a shared driveway, then that hard surface needs to be included for your project. Um, basically, the the project hard surfaces are any hard surfaces that are required to do that project so if you have a driveway that is going out to the street even if it's on somebody else's property but it's required for your project that hard surface needs to be included in the thresholds and 
uh, potentially mitigated or collected and discharged properly. Um, let's see, I'll get back to the presentation. Thanks for the questions though. Um, so yeah, so infiltration, feasibility and testing. So when on-site stormwater management is required or if there's a special situation such as there's no approved off-site point of discharge. And I think at the end of the presentation, I'll get into more specifics about, about that. But infiltration feasibility is required for any project that requires on-site stormwater management. So if you're 1500 square feet or more, then you need to evaluate the site for infiltration. Um, a lot of the sites, a lot of sites will not even need any sort of testing or on-site uh, evaluation because if you look at this map, and this is available on our SDCI GIS website, um, this layer shows uh, pretty significant swaths of the city. I mean, we know the city, it's pretty hilly. Um, and a lot of these pink areas are, those are the areas where infiltration investigation is not required, mostly because they're going to be near or on steep slopes and you don't want water go necessarily going into the ground um, next to a steep slope because it could impact the stability of that slope. So the, we've developed this map to say, it doesn't matter what your soils are doing on site. You're, you, you, uh, it, you don't need to go any further with infiltration investigation because it's, it's near a steep slope. Um, so the, so if you're not part of that map, then you'll need to actually go on site and do some investigation there. Um, there are other situations that infiltration uh, feasibility can stop pretty early on. Um, say you have a zero lot line commercial building. There's no room on site for you to infiltrate. There's no actual um, vegetated area. So you wouldn't need to actually investigate on site. There's nowhere to put the facility. Um, but if, if you do need to investigate on site, there's a simple test which is basically you're gonna go into the yard, dig a hole about two by two by two feet, um, put a, a ruler into the hole, fill it up, uh, take note at different time intervals about how fast that water is getting into the ground. Um, and the checklist goes step-by-step step through that process. So anybody can do that type of test, the small, the pilot infiltration test is a more sophisticated test and it requires a professional to do that test. Um, it's, it's a way of uh, better mimicking an actual facility. And, uh, but the simple test can be done by anybody. Um, and the actual checklist is gonna guide you through that process. So what you're looking for is, is the water getting into the ground? Um, you're also looking for, it, you know, if you take your shovel and you try to um, dig into the ground, there's, there's many places in the city that you won't really be able to dig. It's the, the soil is going to be so hard that you can't really dig um, with any sort of ease. Um, that's considered hard pan soil. So if, if say you try to dig into your backyard and that shovel's not going anywhere, then uh, you can just stop there. I mean, if it's so hard that you can't dig it out, the water's not going to get in there or it's not going to be very effective. Um, also, if the, if you dig down and you see standing water, so that's groundwater, um, that's also a reason why it's not going to work. So if you if you see water in the hole, then you can stop there as well it's not going to be feasible to infiltrate on site. Um, if you don't see either one of those, basically you're, the test is going to show you how well the soil, the water gets into the ground. And based upon how well it gets into the ground, that's going to help select what kind of BMP you can use. Um, so those checklists are available on the Stormwater Code website. 
And once you get that result, you can see this as a table that kind of shows you what the minimum measured rate. So the measured rate is the actual rate that you that you measured when you were out there doing the testing. Um, and this gives you a summary of that measured rate and which BMP you can use based on that rate. If you get a really good rate that water's just disappearing pretty quickly, then the dry wells or infiltration trenches can be used. Um, more moderate rates are the ones that can use things like rain gardens, infiltration, um, uh, permeable pavement facilities, and we'll get into some details about what those look like a little bit later here. Um, and then if the water's not going anywhere, then you're you're looking at non-infiltrating facilities. So a common one is a non-infiltrating bioretention. So again, this overall kind of process, you're gonna go on site, see how well the site infiltrates, then you use that to inform what BMPs you're going to use. Um, and then, uh, obviously, then you go build it. So let's fast forward here. And that information gets documented in the on-site stormwater management calculator. You can see that section right here where it um, gets entered. And then that automatically feeds into the calculator for things like sizing, and for which BMP you can select. So that information needs to be filled out if on-site stormwater management's required. Um, and it's possible that, so if, if your site is, is on that map where it's in near a steep slope, you just say infiltration investigation, well actually it is required, but it's not feasible because, oh, I'm, okay, I'm, I'm blanking here, sorry. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not required because it's mapped as such. So you, you still need to fill out this section if on-site stormwater management's required. Um, it's just that you can document that it's mapped as not, as you don't need to actually do the testing. Um, just a little bit of detail about those specific sites that don't have off-site point of discharge. Um, uh, and again, that's going to be identified in your preliminary assessment report, or if it's a smaller project, you can contact us to see if there's an approved off-site point of discharge. So if, if there is no point of discharge, it basically needs to either infiltrate on site, or if infiltration is not feasible, then it would need to be dispersed on site. Um, I'll get into a little bit more detail about what those BMPs look like. Um, that this situation is actually going to be actually going to require the small, the pilot infiltration test. So the simple test is not adequate. Um, a licensed professional is required unless you have a small project. If if you have a small project, we do allow um, anybody to do the pilot infiltration test and use a pre-sized method for the dry well. It's a much more conservative sizing criteria, but it's a way for us to allow projects that are smaller to do the test without um, uh, without having a, a licensed professional. Um, the other wrinkle is that if Say you have a, a site with no offsite point of discharge, but you are near a steep slope. That kind of project is going to require a licensed professional to show that it give us slope stability analysis, basically to to show that your infiltration system is not going to impact that steep slope. So we do require that for certain sites as well. Um, and the. So, so yeah, so the, the infiltration testing is more uh, comprehensive. Uh, a lot of times requires a licensed professional and um, unless you're using the precise method, a licensed professional needs to also size the facility and model it. 
Um, so there's a lot more requirements for if there's no approved offsite point of discharge. So if you do have one of those sites, we we could help you out, we help you guide you through that process. Um, Jessica, any questions right now or? Um, there was a question about tree removal, um, but I uh, responded to that, so I'll deal with that um, offline. But I don't see any other questions or any other hands raised. Okay. The chat doesn't seem to allow entry of text. Is, is Oh, it's not allowing you to? Yeah, I can't type. It's, it won't allow selection of a recipient or entering any message. Oh no. Oh. Um, well, go ahead. If you if you have questions, go ahead. We'll um, we will work on fixing that in the background. Okay. Well, I guess I'm just curious about. Um, is there some general sense of let's say you have a side sewer issue and with uh, a tree of roots infiltrated into the sewer and it leads to the main, but you and you. Need to fix this fairly rapidly. How long does it take to get a permit to do something like that? Um, we for repair permits, we uh, we aim for one business day, but um, I see. Oh, okay. two or three business days. We're 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 pretty quick with the repair permits, and uh, if it's an emergency, the code does allow for you to do the work um, before you get a permit, as long as you've applied for a permit. I see. Um, but I mean, for something like if if you're going to have um, somebody jet out your side sewer or cut out the roots, that doesn't require a side sewer permit. Um, it's only if you're actually going to um, say re uh, replace the pipe itself. Um, and a lot of that those type of questions, this website from Seattle Public Utilities is really helpful. Um, there's a lot of information about maintenance. Um, they they have they talk about tree roots, um, mm -hmm. and then other other kind of defects that you might discover if you do a sewer scope. Um, things like offset joints and sagging pipes. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, side sewers are just one of those things that you don't think about until there's a problem. Um, and, but it's, it's definitely something if you're a property owner to, um, definitely something to, to be aware of and, um, understand, uh, just in case, uh, something does happen. But yeah, to go back to your original question. Yeah, we, we try to turn around those repair permits pretty, pretty quickly. Um, yeah. Great. And, and, and 1 other question, um, you've noted in some of the diagrams in your slides, um, some. Permeable surfaces like you know driveways and things like that. What would would obviously concrete? I assume would be impermeable or asphalt. Mm -hmm. Would would pavers with with you know let's say four by eight inch pavers be considered partially semi permeable? Or, you know, relative let's say gravel. How how does that work? Sure. Um... I mean, I'll, I'll get into a little bit of detail about permeable pavement surfaces. So, oh, okay. Um, okay. There, That's good. There's, yeah. It, so, um, you know, they're required for to meet on site stormwater management. But, you know, um, if you're doing a new driveway and you, you want to do permeable pavement, um, you know, that. That's an option as well, but, um, yeah, I'll get into a little bit of detail. I mean, essentially. There's a lot of options for what permeable pavement could look like um and i'll i'll show you some of those but yeah good, great good thank question. you hey eric yeah um we have a raised hand um muriel lottie okay yeah go ahead muriel if you want to okay so when you let's say you want to put in a rain garden or something like that is there a way to determine whether or not you might get infiltration into your basement or your crawl space right. or you know if you're slab on grade um because i'm all in favor of on-site storm water management but there's also that concern having seen especially uh last winter in july uh january 2nd after that huge you know snow and the heavy heavy rain with all the flooded basements so right uh, how do we do that 
<laughs> sure, sure. Um, so, uh, we do require certain setbacks for infiltration facilities. So, um, if you have a full depth basement, um, it's required that it be uh, any sort of infiltration facility be at least 10 feet away from the structure. Um, if it's not a full basement, then it needs to be at least 5 feet away. Um, the kind of the, the, the theory is that, I mean, that's why we do the infiltration testing and you're, you're making sure that there's no hard pan soil underneath the facility because, um, that's really the, the, the point of concern is that. If you have that hard pan soil where the water is just going to hit and go laterally, that's where it's going to be of concern for maybe getting into the basement. Um, and uh, so, so that's part of the, the testing is to observe not just the soil conditions of where the water is going to go into the soil, but actually even further below it so that you're, you're making sure that that water is getting to a depth um, that's already below below the basement of the structure. And that's why you have that setback as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's really about investigating the soil um, and making sure that you're far enough away from the structure so that that wouldn't be an issue. Thank you. Sure. Eric. Yeah. Another hand raised in the um, chat. Uh, looks like Gorin. Sorry if I'm not saying that right. Just fine. Um, so I've got a question about who's responsible. Like if you're building a garage or a dadu, uh, who's responsible for verifying that that the infiltration system is appropriate? Right. So um, yeah. Again, if if you're doing an infiltration system just for on-site stormwater management, then you you do the simple test and. The drainage reviewer is going to review that test checklist, and I can even bring it up. Um, let's see really quickly. But is it the architect that does this? Is oh, it I see. The um, it, who it, does this? Is it me as the homeowner that needs to do this? Um, it it again, it, it can depend if if you're just doing on-site stormwater management and the simple test is allowed, anybody can do that test. Um, it. You know, I mean, you could hire somebody to do it, or you could do it yourself as the homeowner. Um, we don't have any professional accreditation required. Uh, basically, it, there's going to be an overflow pipe from a system that has an approved point of discharge. So, your the simple test is just so if that system fails in some way, the the water has somewhere to go. But when there's not an overflow and you have to infiltrate on site for no offsite point of discharge, that's why we require the professionals to do that. Um, because the testing is going to be more involved. It's going to mimic the actual facility better. Um, but yeah, if you're just talking about on site stormwater management, there's no specific professional required for that test. Um, basically, and then the drainage reviewer is going to review that checklist. Um, make sure it's done accurately, um, make sure it's signed. I mean, basically you're attesting that the information on the form has been actually conducted and has been done, done per what has been filled out. And the, the drainage reviewer is going to make sure that, um, you know, the depth of the test has been done, um, to the, to the, to the depth that it should be, because, uh, you're not just testing the soil, you're going beneath where. Um, the facility is going to actually put that stormwater into the ground. So you need to make sure underneath of that, that there's no groundwater or hard pan soil that would cause the system to not function properly. So, um, you're making sure that it's getting enough into the ground that it's, it's, it's not going to, um, so, yeah, so it, it depends. I mean, um, Eric, I think, yeah, it, it is more the question of who instigates this because I am completely unaware of where this pops up in the process and okay. uh, knowing is it how does it how do you get this uh, started sure um so it, it you know it depends a lot about what the scope of your project is going to be um, 
just generally, is it the architects, the general contractor, the owner who has to instigate, start the process rolling on the water mitigation, the storm water mitigation? Right. Yeah. I mean, that, that could vary a lot. Um, really, the applicant is responsible for providing the materials when you submit for your building permit application. Um, whoever that might be, uh, sometimes it's a contractor, sometimes it's an architect. Um, yeah, our uh, architect yeah. is doing this, and this is the first time. Well, I have a, sh a preliminary report, not a preliminary report, but a, a generic stormwater mitigation plan. But I was unsure what the next steps were, and this is very. Thank you very much for like clearing up some of this information. I just guess I'm as the owner, I will end up having to do this because I didn't know that I needed to do this. Okay. Um. Yeah. And if you if you have your preliminary assessment report, um, that should tell you whether or not, um, you're going to need to investigate for infiltration. Um, no. All I have is like a bunch of sheets with generic information about stormwater mitigation. And and in our preliminary application, there was nothing mentioned about stormwater mitigation. Okay, yeah, so you probably got a preliminary um, application uh, site visit report, which no. is just going to give you a lot more general information. Um, it's it's uh, so so again. Um, you know, if, if you need assistance with your specific project, you know, you have questions about what you want to, you, what you're going to need to submit. Um, I encourage you to, to contact us at site sewer info at seattle.gov or use our um, virtual applicant services center. Um, then we can, you can send us your address. We can look at your site. You can show us what you're proposing um, and we can kind of go through all the different requirements because it it really can vary from site to site pretty significantly. So it's really something that um, we can assist you with, uh, with really understanding uh, what is going to be required. So, you, so you're not going in your backyard and digging a hole and then realizing, oh, well, you didn't actually have to do that. Um, so we can, we can, you know, we're more than willing to help you walk you through that process for for a specific project. Thank you. That's very helpful. Sure. Eric. Yeah. Another hand um, for a question from Martin, and then we've got a follow up from the chat after um, okay. we've helped Martin. Sure. All right. Good question. So um, we have a bunch of water pulling into the alley uh, up the hill from our house, and when there is heavy rain, the water cascades down the hill towards mm -hmm. our property. There isn't really anywhere the water can go, but into either our house or our neighbor's house. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, given that this, the problem is starting from the alley, is that for the city to fix or how do we basically get this hooked at and addressed? Yeah, I mean, if there's, there's flooding coming from the alley, that should be something that you can report to Seattle Public Utilities Operations. Um, I did, so yeah. I did call them and they, they said that there's nothing for them to do. And that, okay. that's what's kind of puzzling because it, it's like the pink area on the map that you showed in Queen Anne, which uh -huh. is a potential landslide. And obviously the hill getting saturated with standing water, that's not something that is good. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I can can imagine that, you know, we, we do hear a lot of uh, different situations like that um, throughout the city that, um, you know, where the, where there's issues with water coming from other properties. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to say specifically, I mean, if, if the issue is coming from another property and you feel like there's some sort of code violation, we do have a formal, uh, complaint process with our department, STCI, um, where you would describe the issue. And if there's evidence that a property is somehow in violation of the code, um, then potentially there could be some action taken. Um, and, you know, like I said, the other option is Seattle Public Utilities if there's some issue with the right of way. Um, but it sounds like they've already said that um, there is no public issue causing it. Um, Aside from that, about what the city will actually take action for those type of situations, 
you know, a lot of times it's, it's, you know, there's just a lot of site investigation that needs to done, be done um, to really understand where the water's coming from um, and then try to develop a solution to uh, where it doesn't affect uh, your property anymore. Um, it's it's hard for me to speak to a specific issue, but um, basically SDCI has a complaint process, SPU has their operations, um, and if no action is taken, it, it really just, um, you know, it, it, there, there needs to be some, some private investigation to figure out what uh, a solution could be for that particular issue. And for the SDCI complaint process, is there like an email, phone number or something like that that you can share? Yeah, I mean, if you just go to... Um, I just, added a link in the okay, yeah, chat. Yeah, there's, a, there's a link in the chat for that. Um, I, I, that's a different group than ours. I can't speak to whether or not any action would be taken, but it, but again, that's that's for code violations. And if you suspect it's coming from a property that might be in violation of the code, then that's the way to report that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And then before you move on, Eric, okay. um, Wendy posted um, a question from Peter. Peter, did you just want to elaborate and ask your question, or would you just prefer us to um, pull it from the chat? Might yeah, not. Peter's, be. Peter's on the telephone. You can, um, we can start to try to go through. There's at least two people I think I see on the phone. And I'm not sure how the unmute request works on the phone. I've just sent an unmute request to each of the call in users. If, um, if you're on the phone, can you let us know and ask your question? I, I think that's the best that we can do with the dial in phone users. Okay, um, from what Wendy posted for Peter's question, um, he's asking if you could discuss the remediation and preparation um, of compacted earth that is not going to be covered by an impermeable surface. Um, so, yeah, that might be a good segue here. <laughs> um, so, if, if there, are, so say there's uh, any disturbed area on site that does not become a hard surface needs to be, so disturbed means uh, maybe that's where you're storing some of your construction material or you're accessing the site. Uh, all of those areas that do not become hard surface need to be soil amended. Um, and that gets to us to our first BMP here. Um, so soil amendment is essentially you're gonna take uh, all that area uh, till in between uh, one and three quarters and three inches of compost into eight inches of topsoil and then cover that with mulch and vegetation. So any of those areas need to be soil amended. The soil amended is gonna help uh, not just grow the plants, but also mitigate the stormwater where it, where it falls. Um, it, the soil amendment is going to, um, you know, again, help grow the plants, but also, um, you know, loosen up the soil so the stormwater can get into it. So, yeah, so that was a pretty timely question because that's our first uh, BMP. And those areas need to be shown on the construction soil, um, construction stormwater control plan. Uh, I'll show an example of that later on. You're going to identify those areas on your site that are going to be disturbed that will not become hard surfaces, and those areas are going to be uh, compost amended. And the calculator actually has a place for how much area that's going to be, and it estimates the amount of soil amendment that will need to be imported for that area. So, yeah, so I'm just starting to go through the on site stormwater management BMPs. I'm just going to get into detail, like so, some of the detail. Um, there's, there's no way I can get into all the detail 
the the stormwater manual for every BMP has a whole section of each each BMP. It describes it, uh, talks about uh, how it operates, the sizing, um, different way, requirements for the construction of those BMPs. So all the detail is going to be in the manual for each one of these BMPs. Um, so I'm just going to do a kind of a fairly quick overview of all the different BMPs for on-site stormwater management. Uh, this first one is tree protection. So um, for each one of the BMPs, I'm going to just kind of briefly talk about the stormwater functions of the different BMPs. And for tree protection, particularly, um, it's... Uh, it helps with interception of the uh, the stormwater. It helps to get into the ground. Um, the leaves help capture the stormwater um, and evaporate it. The, some of the stormwater gets taken up by the tree. So trees are really um, an effective way to manage stormwater on site. Tree planting and retention is a BMP that can be used to meet on site stormwater management. Uh, requirements. However, it's in a really low category, um, but uh, we do require if if you are going to be retaining trees on site, they might not be used for on site stormwater management. But if they are going to be um, be kept on site, the one of the BMPs that are required during construction is um, that a, a fence be put around the tree. And um, you can see that, uh, so this is the tree protection construction stormwater control BMP um, to help protect the tree. And also new trees can also be used for, to meet onsite stormwater management. So dispersion BMPs, it's, uh, there's different kinds of dispersion BMPs. Essentially, what they do is they help to spread the water out along a vegetated flow path. And along that flow path, the water can uh, slowly get into the ground. It spreads out and it's, it's a um, effect, effective way for mitigating stormwater. Dispersion BMPs do not require an overflow. So if you're able to get enough vegetated flow on site, that's where the stormwater is going to go. And um, it, for urban environments, these are not very common just because there's not, it, it, they require a lot of room on site. So it's, it's harder for projects to meet all of the different setbacks, uh, flow path requirements for dispersion BMPs. Um, there's different types of dispersion BMPs. We can see this first example. Um, this is a sheet flow dispersion, and it's typical for pathways and driveways. Basically, the, the, the stormwater flows off to the side, and then all of this area is vegetated where it can uh, spread out and get into the ground. And um, this is a uh, splash block downspout dispersion. It's where the downspout from the house hits a splash block and the splash block is just meant so that the water hitting the ground doesn't erode the soil and it also gets it away from the house before it starts um, getting into the ground. And that dispersion flow path requires a minimum of 50 feet. So this one in particular, you can start to see how it doesn't apply for many properties. It, it certainly can apply to um, a project, but it's just not going to be quite as, as common. Um, there is restrictions for dispersion BMPs. You can't um, disperse on site if there's any sort of environmental critical area, particularly steep slopes or uh, slide prone areas, there's going to be restrictions. Um, any sort of contaminated site, it can't um, do that. And, uh, you know, basically, since the water's getting into the ground, it's sim similar to infiltration. Uh, 
it's going into the ground and also flowing off the surface. So you don't want that water on steep slopes because it can compromise those, uh, those slopes. This is similar to dispersion. It's a compost amended strip. It's just a, 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 another way of dispersing and helping that water get in to the ground. Uh, in, infiltration facilities. So we talked a little bit about the testing earlier and the infiltration trenches is one of the more effective infiltration facilities. Um, basically, it's a, uh, a trench that's filled with aggregate or, you know, small rocks so that the water gets in there. It's held in the space in between the rocks and then it slowly gets into the soil. And this example would be, say, for a driveway, the the it, the water's sheet flowing off onto in right into the infiltration trench. Um, they can also be covered as well. Uh, but if if you are going to sheet flow, it has there has to be a filter strip, and if it comes from the building, it has to go through a catch basin first. Uh, the reason for that is the stormwater is going to have uh, sediment in in as it flows. And you don't want that sediment getting into the rocks because it's going to clog it up. It's going to reduce the amount that it can store. So that water needs to first go through a filter strip or a catch basin to get rid of the, the um, sediment before it goes into the facility. Um, it, the BMP needs infiltration investigation, so you have to... Uh, make sure that it's going to work. And if you're using it for OS, uh, on site stormwater management. It the soil test needs to show that it's at least 5 inches per hour, um, which is a really effective infiltration rate. So you have to demonstrate that it has a really good infiltration rate to use them. And again, similar to to um, dispersion BMPs, there's restrictions for certain environmental critical areas. Uh, um, more specifically for steep slope and. Um, slide prone areas of the city. Drywall is basically like an infiltration trench, but it's deeper and uh, not as wide, uh, but effectively it operates the same way. You can see in this detail, this has an example where the roof downspouts actually going into it. And here's that catch basin to, uh, to trap the sediment before it goes into the facility. But effectively, it's got the same restrictions and in infiltration testing requirements. So infiltration bioretention and rain gardens is uh, a landscape depression where the stormwater gets collected and it aids in um, the ability of the soil to hold and slowly release that stormwater into the ground. And the the uh, the soil and the vegetation help in that process, and uh, there are specific plants that need to be used for the facility, and um, it's it's another really effective way for uh, managing stormwater on site. The again the same infiltration restrictions and testing is required. It's just that the infiltration rate required for a infiltrating bioretention or rain garden is not as high as it would need to be for the dry well and infiltration tr trenches. Permeable pavement facilities. So uh, permeable pavement is a way to the stormwater to get into the in into the below the pavement. Um, but still providing that stability that's needed for walkways, driveways, and a permeable pavement facility not only manages the water that hits the pavement itself, but it can also manage runoff from other impervious surfaces, such as a building downspout. So the facility and the uh, surface, which I'll talk about in a bit here, are effectively the same, but the facility has a deeper uh, aggregate below so that you have that storage area. It also has an under drain for that acts as an overflow. So when it's a high storm event 
and this fills up that the water has a place to go without uh, surfacing. Um, but this basically you could put a building downspout into that aggregate below and it, it could mitigate not just the driveway, but it all also could mitigate a uh, building roof downspout. Same infiltration testing and restrictions are apply. Uh, rainwater harvesting is not very commonly used, uh, basically because rainwater harvesting requires that you use the stormwater that is collected for domestic use. So things like uh, toilets and faucets, uh, dishwasher. So yeah, it has to be shown that it's being used within the building as well. Uh, we have had a couple projects that that use these, um, uh, they they are a, a great way for using stormwater in a and and managing it on site in a really productive way because you're not just uh, managing the stormwater on site, you're reducing your potable water use uh, in the building as well. Um, this is different. Rainwater harvesting BMP is different than single family residential cisterns, which I'll get to shortly here. Oh, next slide. Um, single family cisterns, uh, they're just, they, the difference is, is that the water is not going to be used for potable use in the house. Uh, it, it has an orifice, which is basically a uh, smaller hole than the pipe size itself so that the stormwater when it when it comes into the cistern it it slowly releases the stormwater instead of it just going into the public system so that helps with uh the public system because uh when when it when you have a high rain event it's it's going to slowly release that into the system so that it, the the system capacity can be, basically catch up, and that's what the cistern um, can help accomplish. And also, the cistern is quite commonly used for landscape uses as well for um, watering. It's the the landscape uses can be. Uh, really as you know the climate in seattle we have really dry summers and that's when you want the rainwater um that's when you want to irrigate your your um garden so you really have to have a pretty large tank for that to be a really effective thing um because you're you're storing it from the wet season into the dry season but uh, another good use of rainwater is for irrigating your uh, garden. Uh, vegetated roofs, uh, these are when you put plants on the roof. It's uh, an effective way to mitigate stormwater. The, the plants themselves uptake some of the water. It slows the water down um, and also the soil as well helps with that slowing and reducing the amount of stormwater that is discharged from from the site. Uh, this can be used to meet on-site stormwater management. There's a lot of other uh, things to consider when you're using this because it's you know the roof has to be specially designed to install a vegetative roof on on a building. See permeable pavement surfaces like the facility, but um, uh, doesn't have that storage, that that high storage underneath, so it can only mitigate the water that falls on it itself. And here's a link to the different wearing courses. So um, I had mentioned this earlier, but there's a lot of different uh, surfaces that can be put on the top of it. It could be uh, this one is permeable concrete. Uh, just basically concrete without the fine um, fine particulates so that the water can get underneath. Um, there's also pavers that have gaps in between the pavers so the water can get in. And there's other things like um, grid systems that you can actually put grass 
on top and you can drive on them. Um, these just don't work as well if you're doing a lot of um, turn movements for your car, because it'll obviously just ruin the grass. But um, there's a lot of different options for permeable pavement. Um, this is a really common one is non infiltrating bioretention. It's basically either can be a concrete planter box or have look like the rain garden and bioretention just with an impermeable liner. Uh, it's a way to treat the stormwater, reduce the amount of water that actually discharges to the system. And um, these are really common for sites that infiltration is not feasible for. So a few example plans really quickly. Um, I think I can zoom in on this. So this is an example of the construction storm water control plan. Um, this is going to show the different BMPs that are going to be required for your site to manage stormwater when you're dur it, during construction. Uh, we look for a stabilized construction entrance so that basically so that you can. Uh, get vehicles on there that are not going to then track sediment off site into the uh, back onto the road uh, filter fence. And you can see a detail here. It basically holds the stormwater against that filter fence so that you're not not discharging sediment on off site um, and a, a stockpile location that needs to be covered. Um, when it's left on on site and then this this green area is all the 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 disturbed area that's not going to be part of this building so that needs to be shown as soil amended as we um, talked about earlier this is a quick example of a drainage and wastewater control plan you see that we have the the completed summary sheet over here um, and then on the actual plan itself, it's going to break down the site based on what is being proposed. And you can see there, there's a DADU uh, or an accessory dwelling unit uh, proposed in the in the uh, rear yard. So they show that as one surface, and then they have this driveway and walkway surface that's proposed. Um, the um, so that and then the sanitary and storm connections also need to be shown and the the storm connection needs to be shown to where it's going to uh where the approved point of discharge is going to be and also the the side sewer needs to be shown the sanitary connection from the building if required needs to be shown to connect to where it needs to connect to um for these DADU sites it, it's it's really common for the sanitary just to connect to the existing on site side sewer that serves the existing house. Uh, just another quick example. This is a project that had no off site point of discharge. So they, they had to do the small pilot infiltration test and discharge all the storm water on site. They proposed an infiltration trench. Um, for this system, and this had to be designed by an engineer. Um, also, you have to show an emergency overflow and make sure that it's not going to impact any adjacent properties um, in the case of failure of the system. So that's what we need to see. If you're submitting for a building permit that requires drainage review, we need the completed uh, CSC plan and drainage and wastewater control plan with your submittal. Um, here's a couple, some, some additional resources and information. Um, this is a link to how to apply for a side sewer permit, uh, and walks you through that process. The King County sewer use capacity charge. So this applies to any new or re reconnected dwelling unit. Um, King County has a charge that they levy for. Uh, new dwelling units that were connected after, I believe, 1991. Um, it doesn't apply to an existing house that you're renovating. Uh, it, it would only apply to, say, a, a new accessory dwelling unit or a new single family residence. Um, just some information about that. Uh, Rainwise program. Um, 
this is a program that uh, homeowners can uh, the the it sub um, provides rebates for projects to install cisterns or rain gardens on property. Uh, these are going to be, and it would have to be an eligible property. Uh, mostly, these are just going to be in, in areas that have combined sewers because it's going to reduce those combined sewer overflows that we had mentioned uh, earlier on. Um, there's a link for that. Um, also, sometimes side sewer repair work can be quite expensive. Um, there is a um, and there's a link here for zero interest loans for those who qualify that. And this doesn't just apply to side sewers. It can apply for other home repairs. Um, it's a, a, a joint program with uh, the Office of uh, Housing, I believe, that provides uh, zero interest loans for homeowners that need to do repairs uh, for those who qualified. So I just put some of those additional resources in the presentation there. Um, so, yeah, um, the, the appointment was till 1230, but, um, you know, I'm still here to, to, um, answer some questions for, um, um, yeah. So thanks again for attending. We really appreciate you, your interest and, um, please feel free to reach out to us directly. Again, that side tour info at seattle.gov is a great resource that's staffed by our team. And uh, we can answer a lot of specific questions that I'm not able to get to in a presentation like this. Um, and then again, using that chat function on the website. And I do want to remind everybody, uh, Wendy just put, thanks Wendy for putting that link in there. Um, if you could please take a uh, take a couple minutes, it's a quick survey just to let us know if this was helpful. Um, any ideas for future presentations? Um, if you if you are able to do that, that would be uh, really appreciated. And then again, just another plug for our in person home fair coming up. Later this month, um, you know, again, it's going to be a lots of different groups from uh, our department that can answer not just we'll have somebody from our team there for storm and site sewer questions, but there's going to be inspection groups there. There's going to be general building uh, people there to answer questions about building code. Um, so there, there's uh, land use questions. So there's going to be a, a lot of different teams and it's. It's a good opportunity if you're thinking about a project or you have a project to come in and and get a lot of questions answered um, in person. So we're 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 thankful that we can have our in person again. It's, it's obviously it's been a couple of years. So if if you're interested in that, um, come join us. So um, with that, uh, yeah, let me know if you have any additional questions here. Eric, Jean had her hand up. Okay. Um, oh, there she goes again. Go ahead, Jean. Hi. Yeah, I just wondered when the uh, record. This has been a really helpful session. Thank you so much. And I wondered when the recorded version will be available so we can go back and catch up on things we didn't quite take notes on. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. Wendy, can you answer that or? No, I'm not sure. Um, this. Should all be reposted to the home fair page where I think you may have possibly found the original link. Um, it's going to take us a little while to round up all the material and get it posted, but that's our plan. Great. Thanks, Daniel. Tracy has her hand up. Hi. What is the name of the map that had the pink um, part with the infiltration? Yeah, um, that's our uh, SDCI GIS map. So let's see, I, I usually just do an online search. So if you say SDCI GIS, um, that should get you there. Actually, that's that's the old link, but it'll give you the new link. I'll pay it's. I, the reason I didn't put it in the presentation is just really oh well it is in the presentation too but I'll just 
copy it here. Is it the pink parts that need the infiltration or is it the non pink parts? Right, sure. Um, let me get some of these other layers off first. See it. Um, so the, the pink area are the areas of the city that it is the infiltration is not required. Okay. So those are the steep slope areas of the city. Okay, thank you. Sure. Jane, did you have another question? I see your hand up. Sorry, one more. I was the one that asked about the Dadu that's adding 150 square feet. Um, it turns out it does have, the existing garage does have um, gutters and downspouts, but it wasn't shown on the map with the, the drain, you know, it didn't show a little line connecting to it. So I'm assuming that those downspouts are attaching to wherever the downspouts on the house are attached. Can we just attach to the same system? Yeah, more than likely. I mean, if drainage review is not required, um, basically it becomes a subject to field inspection of what you're going to do with your drainage for the new hard surfaces. All the existing hard surfaces can just continue to do what they're doing now. We don't, we, we wouldn't back regulate that. Um, okay. Uh, but more than likely, I mean, if you have that, that for that bump out, you're just going to, uh, basically, when you're um, when you start when you do your first ground disturbance, your site inspector is going to say, um, and again, just because drainage review is not required, not isn't uh, doesn't say that we can't kind of help you understand what you know. Again, what your site needs to do, um, really, it just becomes something that you just gets worked out in the field where you just got to figure out something that makes sense that it's not going to discharge onto the neighbor's property. Sometimes it's just digging a little rock pit. Um, okay. So it, it depends. And like I said, we can, you know, help guide you through kind of what maybe what it looks like um, if you contact us directly. Okay. Um, uh, if you want to try and figure that out ahead of time. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you. And then it looks like Joe Kaiser has his hand up. What do you do if your property is partially in the infiltration not required zone and partially in the property in the infiltration required zone? Right. Um, so basically the whole property for the most part, if um if a a portion of the property, it, the drainage reviewer is going to really look at that, kind of scrutinize that a little bit closer. Um, I, I kind of want to say it de just depends. Uh, for a small site, if, you know, if it's pretty obviously covered by a, a decent amount of that layer, then we're going to say, no, you don't need to do it. Um, but if it's just barely touching it, or if we actually look at the setbacks that it's, um, cause the map isn't a hundred percent accurate. Um, it might be picking up on something that's actually not a steep slope. Um, so if it's, you know, we try to, we, tr we err on the side of uh, basically the answer is we err on the side of it's not going to be required. Um, but, but it depends. Um, and um, we can we can help you make that determination if you have a specific site, and that determination will be made in your preliminary assessment report as well. If if you do get one of those, um, for larger sites, you know, it doesn't really apply. We're gonna if if just a portion of a large site is covered by the pink, we'd say you still have to evaluate for infiltration investigation, but it just the facility just wouldn't go where, you know, where that location is, where it's mapped as not required. So kind of a long answer, but yeah, it kind of depends. But we, we try to be fairly err on the side of that it's not required. Tracy has your hand up again. Okay, so I have, I'm building the Dadu and I had the pit test done and it totally failed. 
And now my um, architect is pushing me to talk to an engineer. And how do I know if that's necessary or not? Right. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, th this kind of depends too, but really. So if if the project doesn't have a approved offsite point of discharge and drainage review is required, meaning that the amount of hard surface is more than 750, um, then you either need the engineer to do the test or you if it's a small project less than 1500 you could you, we do allow our dadus for you to do still do the test um the test has already been done is that the test you're talking about uh yeah well yeah <laughs> it's it's yeah it's hard hard without seeing a lot of the specifics of the project itself. But I mean, if if there's no offsite point of discharge, you basically have to find a way to discharge it on site. And an engineer may or may not be required. I'd have to look at the specific project, but um, basically uh, an engineer could provide a design for say a shallower facility so maybe the soil's not good at the four foot drywall depth, but you could get it with the two foot infiltration trench depth, and um, that would be designed by the engineer. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry, it's it's hard for me to to tell you really specifically, but I I again I, I do want to encourage you know you to contact us directly with your project and. We can certainly walk you through um, the options a, a little bit more specifically. Um, you know, we can pull up the plans, look at the map. Um, it, it, it's that would be, I think, what I would suggest for that particular um, question. It it may or may not be required. Essentially, the engineer. All right. Thank you. Sure. Okay, looks like that's, I mean, I want to thank everybody again for coming. This is um, uh, really great and we'll, we'll get that, uh, get the presentation posted and um, yeah, contact us with more questions and um, yeah, thanks a lot.